Ladies and gentlemen, the President and CEO of the National World War II Museum, Stephen Watson. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome to the U.S. Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing Center. Um, I think it's great to close out what has been a magnificent couple of days here in this uh, beautiful pavilion, and I think it's just great that here we are underneath these six warbirds, our, our Mustang, our, our Corsair, our Avenger, our B-25, of course, uh, our B-17, and... Uh, Mr. Hilliard, we were in your conference center for the last two days, and now we're right underneath your plane, the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber. So uh, thank you again for all you've done to support the museum. And uh, I, I do want to end our conference the same way uh, that we started, and that is by giving uh, our participants in the war, our World War II veterans, our resistance fighters, uh, recognition for their service. It's just been remarkable to have you with us for the last couple of days. So let's give them a round of applause. And so many of you have already come up to me and said how special it has been to have Nicole, Tony, and Lucky participate as speakers in this, this conference. So thank you for sharing your reflections with us. It's just been extraordinary. Um, I also, of course, want to acknowledge uh, our speakers. And, uh, you know, I said this at the beginning, but many of you have come from far to share with us your time uh, and your talents with us over these last three days. So all of our speakers, thank you for being here. It's just been remarkable to have you. And uh, I want to piggyback on something uh, Dr. Delmont said this afternoon, which is give yourself a round of applause. You all have been a fantastic audience and as always have great questions. So thank you. So I just want to take a, a few moments here to thank the members of our staff who've pulled this uh, wonderful event together. It, it takes a, a village of people from every part of our museum to pull this off. And I, if you can just bear with me for a moment, I just want to recognize uh, several of the folks who have made that happen. And I want to start by thanking our, our AV team uh, in the back. They've been here. Thank you. you. You only notice the AV guys when it doesn't work. And uh, it's worked. So thank you. And uh, you know, it's one of the things that we've always tried to do is make sure that the production values of these conferences for you here and those of you watching online continues to improve. Um, also, our retail team who love this weekend because we know you all love to buy books, but this is a, a special weekend for them. So thank you to Chris Michel and his staff on the retail team. I think we have a, a UPS and a FedEx plane arriving in New Orleans tomorrow morning to ship these out to you guys, so hopefully that's not too much of a budget buster, but um, we'll see. Um, also, uh, our events team here, our facilities crew, they've helped with the planning of this conference. They help with all of the little details that goes into making this happen. So let's give our events team and our facilities team a, a big round of applause. Um, our institutional advancement team and the fundraising team, the membership folks uh, that are here, worked with our partners at the Pritzker Museum, uh, many of you uh, in this room, of course, who have been great supporters, so thank you to the institutional advancement team. Many of you are here tonight as well, so thank you. And uh, I know many of you are also travelers uh, and have... Uh, been to just about every corner of the world with our staff and some of the speakers that are here, but uh, our travel and, and conference team are also an integral part of pulling off this conference. And some of those folks had just gotten back into town from being in France, and others I know, like Carrie, you've been, many of you have been working with for many, many years. So let's acknowledge them for their great work also.
big, big shout out for Carrie, I bet that's what that was. So, um, and then, you know, uh, we consider our team at the Higgins Hotel and Conference Center as part of our team, and I uh, hope you all have enjoyed your stay uh, at the Higgins, and I think they've all done a remarkable job of just making our, our last couple of days feel comfortable and just wonderful. So let's thank the Higgins team for all that they've done also. And, and finally, of course, our, our team in the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War uh, and Democracy, led by a, a gentleman who I will introduce in just a moment, uh, Dr. Mike Bell. But I think just about every member of the Institute has been involved in putting this uh, conference together. And uh, of course, uh, although he hates when I do this, I want to specifically recognize uh, Jeremy Collins. and uh, who's been involved in every one of these conferences, and I know he had a fantastic co-pilot this year, uh, and Andrew Good, so Andrew, thank you. I think this was your first conference. Much appreciated. We know taking care of Jeremy is a big job, so we, we thank you for that. Um, and then, uh, really last but not least, of course, uh, our presenting sponsor, the, the folks at the Pritzker Military Foundation and Pritzker Military museum and library for their continuing support of making this conference great. Okay, so to bring us home, I want to ask our wonderful Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Mike Bell, back to the stage to introduce the final session of our 15th International Conference on World War II. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Stephen. And, uh, I hope everyone's having an amazing uh, evening tonight. Uh, great food, but you know, an amazing venue, but even better conversation. And uh, you know, I think this is an amazing opportunity to culminate what has been an incredible campaign. So since I've been here, they've, we've talked about, you know, we really want to host, uh, as part of our General Raymond E. Mason Jr. Distinguished Lecture, Ben McIntyre. People say, hey, we need Ben McIntyre. And, and uh, the, the, the great piece for us, fortunately, is the stars have aligned and we have an opportunity to have Ben with us uh, this year. And uh, hopefully he thinks the stars have aligned as well, but uh, you know, we certainly do. And I, I think this will be, the goal this, this time was to bring different perspectives on each of the sessions, hear from uh, amazing participants, authentic voices, uh, different views, different theaters, but, but really to bring this uh, to a kind of culmination uh, this evening. And so no pressure, Ben. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tough act to follow, though, particularly after Don's uh, tour de force with Lucky Luckadoo in this last piece. So I just, just want to, you know, make sure the, the bar is set high enough. So um, Ben's the associate editor for The Times, and he's a, a best-selling author of a, a incredible nine books, including A Spy Among Friends, which won the 2014 Spears Book Award. Uh, he's a leading expert on the history of espionage, uh, which is always a kind of, you know, crowd pleaser. So if you can't like espionage, you know, you're probably either asleep or you're in the wrong conference. The, uh, and, and his work, is, his scholarships uh, inspired these you know, popular adaptations, and including the 2022 Netflix and Warner Brothers release, Operation Mincemeat, uh, the true story uh, that changed the course of World War II. So I commend that for you, which is based on his 2010 book of the same name. So Operation Mincemeat. You know, tonight you can watch it on Netflix, uh, but not yet. You have to wait till after we're done. Uh, earlier this year, the BBC released uh, SAS, Rogue Heroes, which is a mini-series based on Ben's uh, very extensive research into the British Special Air Service uh, secret files uh, in his book, Rogue Heroes. So, um, you know, another kind of amazing kind of transition piece is we're talking about how do we hook these other generations who in many ways are exposed to the war through these other venues, you know, different than uh, than through books and other areas like that. And so Ben, I think, you know, congratulations, you know, Mabrook, you've done a phenomenal job of, of doing that through your scholarship. 
Now tonight, Ben's going to uh, provide us with a look at his most recent book, uh, Prisoners of the Castle, an epic story of survival and escape from Kolditz, the Nazi fortress prison, and then certainly in the Q&A, an opportunity to talk to him about his, his corpus of work, which has been quite incredible and, and impressive over the years. So with that uh, team, please help me welcome Ben McIntyre to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, can I first of all say what an incredible honor and privilege it is uh, to be able to give this closing few remarks. It has been a fantastic um, uh, conference. I've attended every session. I have learned so much. And thank you all for this wonderful, very warm Louisiana welcome. Um, so from this cheerful moment, I'm going to take you somewhere extremely grim. Now, is it coming up on these as well? No, not yet. Yes. This gorgeous creature, who looks exactly like an English RAF pilot, is in fact, goes by the unimprovable name of Joseph Florimond du Sossois Duke III, <laughs> because he is in fact American. Um, <laughs> Duke was the first American prisoner in Colditz. He was the oldest paratrooper in the American Air Force at 52, and he was probably the least successful secret agent of the Second World War. <laughs> but he played a critical role in the Colditz story. He arrived in 1944, um, and he had an extraordinary effect on the morale of the prisoners who were there, because as the first American, he was really the first intimation that the war was coming, that the Americans were coming. Um, so he's, he's an important way to start this story in a way, because he is emblematic of one of the themes of this book, which is that there are many different ways to fight a war. Uh, Florimon du Sossois Duke III, never fired a shot in anger. But he played, as, as you will find out towards the end of this story, a, a really pivotal role in what happened in Colditz. He was, had been an advertising ex executive for Time Life. Uh, he had been an ambulance driver in the First World War. And so he could easily have sat out the Second War. Uh, he was extremely uh, well off. Part of the family owned Pan Am Airlines. He owned a large chunk of Connecticut, as far as I've been able to work out. Uh, but he decided nonetheless that he was insistent that he wanted to fight and participate. So he inveigled his way into the OSS, uh, was placed on the Hungary desk, a country about which he knew absolutely nothing, and was then parachuted with three other Americans into Hungary uh, in an operation called Operation Sp uh, Sparrow. Now, you won't have heard of it because it was an abject failure. Uh, because what Duke didn't know was that he, his job was to parachute into Hungary and try and persuade the Hungarian government, which was wobbling at this point in the Axis embrace, to, to come away and to sort of desert Hitler and, and join uh, the Allied powers against him. What he didn't know was that, in fact, the American codes in Bern had been broken by the Germans, and the Germans knew he was coming. Um, and so he managed to stay at liberty for about 12 hours uh, before he was arrested along with his companions, and taken to this place. This is Kolditz Castle, uh, Schloss Kolditz. It stands on the eastern edge of Germany. It's about 20 miles from Leipzig. It's a vast 11th century Gothic castle. It has 700 rooms. It, it towers over the little town of Kolditz. It's built on a cliff face. And it was the hereditary palace, really, of the electors of Saxony, the great hereditary rulers of Eastern Germany. And it was always intended to be an awe-inspiring place. It was intended to intimidate. And it was also always a place of incarceration. Uh, frequently, it was a place of incarceration for the unwanted relatives of the electors of Saxony. Um, the rightly named Augustus the Strong, who had 273 children, um, locked up quite a lot of them in Schloss Kolditz. Um, it then subsequently became um, a, 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 a mental asylum. It then became very briefly a concentration camp 
um, as the Nazis were coming to power. And then, uh, in, early in the war, in the middle of 1940, it became Offlag 4C, a prisoner of war camp for captured allied officers. It's very important that the distinction is made here. These were, this was an officer's camp, and it was run by the Wehrmacht, so it was, it was, a, it was an army-run camp. It was not a concentration camp. It was not a place of casual savagery. It was run mostly under the terms of the Geneva Convention. So the people who ran this prison camp tried to stick by the rules. And the idea was that it would be, first of all, impossible to escape from. And secondly, it was intended to house all the most difficult prisoners of the Reich. They were defined as Deutsch Feindlich, which is a germ, almost untranslatable German word, but it means literally German unfriendly. And these were prisoners, mostly who had tried, officers, who had tried to escape from other camps. So the idea was that it was to be, in the German terms, it was supposed to be the bad boys camp. Now, if you are British, the very word Kolditz has a, an extraordinary resonance. Um, it is really very much part of British founding mythology. Um, but it, it was not just a prison camp for, for Brits. As, as I've explained, uh, the Americans arrived a little late, um, but they arrived nonetheless, as they did for the war. Um, but it, it also contained French, Polish, Dutch, Belgian, Commonwealth soldiers. It really was a completely international camp. And it developed a very strange atmosphere because in many ways, it became a kind of microcosm for the outer world that these officers had known beforehand. It developed its own culture. It developed its own theater. It even developed its own form of cookery. There was a brewery in the basement. They produced, there was a winery. They produced Chateau Colditz. Um, they even produced their own very peculiar kind of language because they were sealed off from the rest of the war. Prison camps have a, a prisoner of war camps have a very particular atmosphere to them. Um, they're very different from civilian prisons because they are, the, the prisoners inside them are literally prisoners of the war. They have no notion of when they are going to escape. Unlike civilian prisoners, they cannot tick off the passing days towards a moment of liberty. They don't know when they're going to get out. So that lends a kind of a strange stress to a prisoner of war camp. And the other aspect is that a lot of these officers were captured very near the beginning of the war. Many of them were professional soldiers who felt that they had failed in their duty, that they had somehow not managed to do what they were trained to do. And so the urge to get out and to get back to their native countries and to rejoin the war was very, very urgent. So the story of Kolditz is often told as if it is the story of a band of brothers who stuck together and, and uniquely attempted to escape from this castle that was supposedly impossible to escape. And the myth of Kolditz has stood unchanged and largely unchallenged for about 70 years. And the myth is that of a brave British officer with a mustache on a stiff upper lip trying to break out of this castle by any possible means, tunneling, sliding down the outside on ropes made from sheets. At one point, they built a glider in an effort to try and fly out of the castle. And, of course, like many legends, that is partly true, but it is not the whole truth. Because while Kolditz did contain some extraordinarily imaginative and resolute people who were dedicated to escaping, and there were more attempted escapes from Kolditz than any other prison camp. It also contained other sorts of people. There were communists, there were scientists, there were poets, there were also spies, there were also traitors inside Kolditz. Now, the person most responsible for creating the Kolditz myth is this man. His name was Pat Reed, and he was the first British uh, prisoner into Kolditz, excuse me. And after the war, he hated the place on site and then spent most of the rest of his life writing about it. <laughs> he wrote three books after the war, which became huge bestsellers. He was also the advisor on a very, very successful 
multi-part television documentary made by the BBC. It was then the most popular in the 70s, the most popular drama series ever made by the BBC. And what Reed did was to give the misimpression he, he was one of those extraordinary people, Reed, that was never got down by war. He, he, he regarded escaping as his sacred duty, and he talked about almost nothing else. And he gave the lasting misimpression that everybody in Colditz had been just like him, but they weren't. His main antagonist in this um, prison was a man called Reinhold Eggers, Hauptmann Reinhold Eggers, who would become the head of security for Colditz. So if you like to think of Pat Reed as being the person who was in charge of trying to escape from this place, Eggers was the man trying to stop them. He was a highly intelligent man. He was extremely civilized, very polite. I, I had the huge good luck um, to find his memoir um, and also a set of photographs that he'd gathered into a sketchbook with his personal annotations in them. Eggers is an extraordinary man, and in many ways, he is the sort of hidden second narrator of this story. Now, Eggers had been a school teacher uh, before the war in the town of Halle, not far from Colditz. And he was no fool, Eggers. Uh, he'd actually, believe it or not, he taught in the, uh, in the, in the rural town of Cheltenham uh, before the war in, a, in an English public school, and he treated the prisoners of Colditz as if they had been particularly badly behaved schoolboys. Um, now, as a school teacher, he also knew that if you pack all the most badly behaved pupils into one classroom, they egg each other on. And pretty soon, your classroom is on fire. Um, and that is what happened in Colditz. Uh, it didn't burn down, but the different prisoners competed to try to escape from it. And what's more, the different nationalities competed with each other to try to get out of Colditz. There was a kind of wary collusion within and among the different nationalities in, in, in Colditz. But they were also competing. There was one moment when five different tunnels were being built simultaneously by different groups of prisoners. And they were quite literally undermining each other. <laughs> the other thing that Eggers worked out very early on was that while Colditz Castle looks very imposing and is very imposing. Um, it is nonetheless an 11th century castle. And it had been built on to so many times. It has five different sewer systems running through it. There were entire wings of the castle that had been bricked up. There were hidden staircases. There were priest holes. It was, in fact, a place that was full of holes. And as Eggers himself said, there will probably never be a worse place to build a prison camp than this castle. If you're building a, a prisoner of war camp, the best place is a very large field surrounded by barbed wire. Um, Colditz was full of holes, and the prisoners did their best to exploit them. So I mentioned that Colditz developed its own culture and very much imported the world, these prisoners, that they had known before. Now, in, certainly in the case of the British officers, most of them had been to British public school, what we would call public school, what you would call private school. And, and many of them were very young, and they came from a tradition of um, the kind of uh, conflict, if you like, between pupils and schoolmasters. And so one of the things, one of the traditions that they developed very quickly was something called goon baiting. Now, the goons, the goon was the nickname for the prison guards. They were known as goons. And goon baiting was the technique of trying to annoy them tease them, ridicule them, uh, just to the point short of explosion, just to the point before they actually shot you. And goon baiting took all sorts of elaborate different forms, and the different nationalities developed different sorts of goon baiting. So, for example, the French were very good at singing rude songs under their breath so that the Germans couldn't tell who they were. Uh, the British liked to pretend to knit on parade or to play imaginary snooker or to cut their hair in strange shapes. Or indeed, one of their favorite things was when the commandant came on parade. There were four parades a day in Colditz. When the commandant came on parade, they would stare fixedly at his fly buttons <laughs> in, in the hope that eventually he would become so self-conscious that he would, he would fiddle with his fly buttons. And that was considered to be an enormous moral victory. 
um, on the part of... My own favorite goon baiting uh, story is the great wasp goon bait of early 1944, when the British discovered a large wasp's nest in one of the castle walls and began systematically capturing wasps. And then, with, uh, very gingerly, with pieces of thread and cigarette paper, they were tying messages to the legs of the wasps, which read Deutschland kaputt. <laughs> they then secreted uh, these wasps in their matchboxes, in their pockets, and on a given signal on, uh, during parade, they released them all at once. And a huge cloud of enormously angry wasps emerged, uh, and the idea was that they would then uh, fly beyond the prison walls and sting Germans and pass on this very important propaganda message. Um, <laughs> I mentioned they also invented their own sports. And, and this is, a, this is a, a drawing of the sport of stool ball, a game that was played inside Colditz and nowhere else. Uh, it was uniquely um, uh, apt to Colditz because the central courtyard of Colditz, which is about the size of a tennis court and cobbled, uh, is very, very dark. And so normal kind of sport couldn't be played there. So they invented stool ball, which was really very simple. Uh, two goalies would sit on stools at either end of the courtyard, and then anything up to 30 or 40 or even 50 players would compete to try to knock him off the, the stool while holding the ball. It wasn't a very complicated game. It was extremely violent. Um, it was really like a cross between cage wrestling and rugby. Um, and there were frequently quite bad injuries were sustained while playing this. The Germans found it utterly baffling. Um, I think it was one of the reasons why there were so few fights among the prisoners in Colditz was because, as one officer said, if you ever wanted to thump someone, you just played stool ball with them. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Colditz had its own theater. Uh, the electors had built an entire theater inside it. And because uh, these were officers, they had certain privileges, and one of them was that they were allowed to bring in costumes from outside, from the Berlin theater. They were allowed to have scenery paint, they were allowed to have makeup, and they put on a huge number of theatrical shows. Um, this is one called Ballet Nonsense, which was put on in Christmas 1941, and it was a kind of combination of pantomime and reviews and skits. Uh, but the piece de resistance was a performance by the corps de ballet, and you see them there on the left in their paper tutus and brassieres, and that is in fact the prima ballerina with the moustache. That is Pat Reed uh, performing. It, the theater was really the absolute sort of focus of an attempt to combat the boredom in Colditz, because actually like most prisons, it was most of the time it was a very dull place. Uh, Pat Reed once said of it, oh, Colditz, there was never a dull moment. That was almost exactly the opposite of the truth. And one of the ways to combat that was to put on performances, musical performances, theatrical performances, skits, and so on. So they actually, at one point in the first two years of Colditz, there was a new performance about once a week. Um, and these were attended not just by all the prisoners, but also by the prison guards. There are these extraordinary photographs of, of the prisoners and their guards sitting quite happily watching uh, the importance of being earnest or a review like this. Um, we've now come to a slightly uncomfortable aspect of Colditz, <laughs> which again has never really been written about before because Colditz was a very divided place in lots of ways. It was a place divided by class, by race, by nationality, by politics, and by sexuality. There was quite a lot of cross-dressing in Colditz, and there was quite a lot of homosexuality. And it's never really been written about, but in quite a few of the private memoirs written in later life, they reveal genuine and actually very moving love affairs that were taking place among the men of Colditz what did we think was going to happen if you lock up men for five years? Of course it happened, although everybody after the war denied it. It's just another example of the way that the Colditz myth, the kind of the established template, doesn't quite fit the truth. Escape was the central conversation in Colditz. Not everybody attempted to escape, but pretty much everybody contributed to 
the escape attempts, and there were many, many, many of them. This is a photograph of a man called Airy Neve. Now, Airy Neve went on to become a Tory MP in Britain. He became a very senior advisor to Margaret Thatcher. And then he was murdered in 1979 uh, by a car bomb inside the Palace of Westminster. It's a tragic story, and he would, have, he would have been somebody that would go on to very great things. He was a very young prisoner in Colditz, and he, he was an interesting man, Airy Neve, because he, he was, he was an undiagnosed depressive, I think. And one of his ways of dealing with that was to obsessively think about trying to escape. And he worked out that actually the best way to get out of Colditz was to be completely brazen. And he decided that if he could make for himself a sufficiently believable uniform, a German uniform, he would simply put it on and walk out of the front door. Um, this was his first attempt. He made this costume, um, and he, he's dressed here as a German NCO. Um, he made it with the help of the theatrical department. He used scenery paint to paint a Polish tunic, what he thought was field gray, which it sort of was inside the gloom of the central courtyard. Um, he got a certain amount of, of the way out. He did, in fact, manage to walk out of the front gate of Colditz, upon which he discovered that when the floodlights hit his costume, it wasn't so much field gray as kind of fluorescent green. Um, <laughs> And in his own words, he looked exactly like a sort of escaping elf. Um, he was captured at once. Uh, the Germans were absolutely furious, uh, less because he was trying to escape. Pretty much everyone was trying to escape all the time, but more because they took it as, a, as an insult to the German uniform. Completely undaunted by this, Airy Neve made himself a second uniform. And this time, he, he, he got a lot of help. The entire cold its community sort of banded together really to try and make a perfectly believable not one but two German uniforms and officers this time so on Christmas Eve uh, 1942 Airy Neve and a Dutch accomplice levered up the boards of the stage the cold its stage and climbed underneath now underneath there they had already discovered was a passageway if they could break through the ceiling that called the witch's walk which ran across the top of the main entrance into Colditz. They climbed into this, they changed into their, into their uniforms, which were almost identical to the real things. They then managed to pick a lock. Uh, most of the locks in Colditz were in fact medieval and they were quite easy to pick. So they climbed through this, then they went down a spiral staircase past the German guardhouse, then they walked out of the main gate, marched out of the main gate, where they were saluted by the two German guards on duty. They then climbed down into the moat, up the other side, climbed over the eight-foot wall that surrounded um, the, castle, the castle park, changed into civilian clothes, caught a train uh, to Leipzig, caught a second train to the Swiss border, and in the middle of the night, in a howling blizzard, they walked across the Swiss border into neutral Switzerland and to freedom. Airy Neve was the first successful British escaper from Colditz. Um, and his story became very well known in the immediate aftermath, uh, partly because he never stopped talking about it. Um, <laughs> so Airy Neve's tale was well known, and it was a great, um, it was a huge morale booster for the, for the prisoners left inside. But I'm now going to tell you a story about another prisoner which has really never been told before. Uh, this man was called Birendranath Mazumdar, and he was the only non-white prisoner in Colditz. He was, in fact, the only Indian officer in the British Army. He was a medic. He was a doctor. He, had, he was born, born near Calcutta, trained as a surgeon, was a very, very good doctor, and he was captured near Dunkirk right at the beginning uh, of the war. And he more or less defined Deutsch Feindlich. I mean, he was, he, he was about as difficult a prisoner as you could get, Berendranath Mazumda. He was constantly harassing the German guards to provide better medicine, to provide better nourishment for the, for the prisoners, and eventually, infuriated by him, they shipped him off to Kolditz, where he was, as I say, the only non-white prisoner. And it is painful to have to say this, but in Colditz, he suffered the most appalling racism. Not from the German guards. The Germans regarded Berendranath Mazumdar as a propaganda opportunity. I'm afraid it was the other prisoners who treated him 
completely as a second-class citizen. He was made to cook and clean. He was uh, made to cook curries all day. He was nicknamed Jumbo. He was mocked for his accent. And worst of all, Mazumdar was told that he was not allowed to attempt to escape from Kolditz because he was the wrong color. He was told that if you leave the castle, they'll immediately identify that you're an escaped prisoner and you won't get very far. Um, as I say, the Germans regarded Mazumdar as a propaganda tool, really, because one of the interesting things about, about, about Mazumdar was that he was a fierce Indian nationalist. He had volunteered uh, for the Royal Army Medical Corps, but nonetheless, he was strongly opposed to British rule in India. The Germans got wind of this and tried to persuade him to broadcast to India on behalf of the Germans. Um, to, at this point, um, some Indian nationalists, led by Subhas Chandra Bose, the great nationalist leader in India, were prepared to fight on the German side. And, and the great, the Indian Legion was being gathered in Berlin, mostly from prisoners of war. And so Birendranath Mazumdar was taken to Berlin where he met Subhas Chandra Bose and he was offered money, he was offered liberty, he was offered very comfortable quarters if he agreed to broadcast on behalf of the Germans. And he wrote a whole series of rather astonishing, very moving poems in Bengali discussing, sort of talking about this intense internal battle he had over whether to accept this very attractive offer from the Germans or whether to stick with his oath of allegiance to the British crown. He, he decided he couldn't break his word of honor. Um, to the Germans' fury, he, he refused their offer. He returned to Colditz thinking that the British and the other prisoners would now treat him uh, as an equal. They did not they now decided that he must be a spy of some sort, and he was completely ostracized. So Berendranath Mazumdar did something very brave indeed. He went on a hunger strike, uh, copying his great um, uh, idol, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He said that he would eat nothing until he was moved to an all-Indian prison. There was one all-Indian prison in, in the south of France. Um, he went on hunger strike for 14 days. He very nearly died, and eventually the commandant relented Berendranath Mazumdar was moved to this all-Indian prison from which he escaped. <laughs> he climbed over an 18-foot barbed wire fence and walked 400 miles across occupied France to the border with Switzerland, where he struggled across the border, presented himself to the British, senior British officer in neutral Switzerland, whereupon he was arrested. It was assumed that Mazumdar could not have done what he'd done without German help. Um, it's a terrible story, but again, it's one that doesn't really fit into our, into our conception of what Kolditz was like. And here's another one. As officers, the prisoners in Kolditz had the right to servants. Um, they, under the Geneva Convention, all captive officers had orderlies, batmen, who would, who would look after them. They would do the cooking and cleaning, but they were also prisoners of war. Um, and you see a, a small group of them here. Their jobs were to cook and clean, polish boots, um, generally keep the place tidy. But they were also not allowed to escape. So you have this extraordinary situation where there is a sort of socio-economic chasm running right through the middle of Kolditz. There is, a, there is a sort of master group and there is a servant group. And the master group, who outnumbered the servants at all times, had privileges. And the, and, and the POWs, the, the ordinary privates um, who, who served them, did not. So at one end of the scale, you have, as it were, a working class in Kolditz. And at the other end was an aristocracy. It is a strange habit of British life that whenever three um, upper middle class Brits are gathered together, they will form, two of them will form a club to exclude the third. Um, <laughs> There was a special group in Kolditz called the Prominente, the prominent ones. That was the German term for them. And these were people identified by the Germans as being people of particular value. So there was one of Churchill's nephews was there, uh, two nephews of the king. There were aristocrats. Uh, there was the son of the American ambassador to London. John Wynert was there as well. So these were people, they weren't really in fact so much prisoners as hostages. They were being held by uh, the German authorities as, as, t as sort of propaganda tools, but also as kind of coupons, really, to be cashed in when the time came, when, the, when they were needed to do so. So you have this extraordinary kind of social 
division. Now, the most famous prisoner in Colditz, by some way, was Wing Commander Douglas Bader. Now, Bader was hugely famous during the war, and in fact, he was almost as famous in Germany as he was in Britain. He had lost both his legs in a flying accident before the war, so he had two uh, prosthetic tin legs. And nonetheless, he managed to persuade the RAF to let him fly, and he became a very successful Spitfire pilot. But he also became a kind of poster boy for the war. The, the war office realized very early on that Bader would be a very useful way of advertising overcoming adversity, um, both in, in, in his own disability but also as a fighter pilot. Uh, Bader was shot down over northern France uh, early in 1942, and as he was bailing out of his Spitfire, one of his prosthetic legs became trapped under the joystick. And as his parachute inflated, the leather straps holding it in place snapped, and he floated free with only one leg. Um, he, was, he was captured on the ground, obviously very quickly, by the Germans. And then something very extraordinary happened. Um, as I say, he was extremely well-known in Germany and was treated as a sort of arriving celebrity. And the Germans, believe it or not, contacted British intelligence with a message to say, Douglas Bader needs another leg. <laughs> and, and amazingly, the, the, the RAF flew one out <laughs> in an operation brilliantly codenamed Operation Leg. <laughs> this extra leg was parachuted into northern France, reattached to Douglas Bader, who immediately tried to escape. Um, he was captured. He was then attempted to escape again. He was recaptured. And then he was taken to Colditz. Now, Bader is an extraordinary character because he was, ex he was quite bafflingly brave. I mean, he was, he was able to inspire feats of courage in other people uh, that they never thought possible. He raised millions for disability charities after the war. But he was also a monster. Douglas Bader was an extremely unpleasant man. He was arrogant, he was rude, he was particularly unkind to anybody he considered to be of lower social status. And that also went for his batman. You see him here, this is, uh, you see Bader with the pipe, and, and between his legs, um, squatting below him, is a man called Alex Ross. Now, Alex Ross was a medical orderly, um, a, a, a private from Scotland, who's, who was there to serve Douglas Bader, and his jobs included cooking and cleaning, carrying Bader up and down four flights of stairs every day for his bath, uh, and generally looking after him. Now, Bader had special rations because he was so well-known. Um, luxuries like eggs and bacon and that sort of thing, none of this ever reached Alex Ross. Alex Ross could never recall a single occasion on which Douglas Bader had actually ever thanked him. Uh, two years before the end of the war, there was a prisoner exchange scheme uh, in which ordinary prisoners, never officers, but, but sort of um, the other ranks, could be swapped out for captured German soldiers. And Alex Ross was selected for this. Uh, and he was excited uh, and very, you know, looking forward to this, obviously, because not least because it meant he would be able to get away from Douglas Bader. Um, so he approached uh, Douglas Bader in the courtyard and said, I have very good news, uh, Wing Commander, I'm going home. And Douglas Bader said, no, you're not. He said, you're my lackey. This is a, this is a quote. You're my lackey, and you've been he brought here to serve me, and that is what you're going to do. And that is what Alex Ross did. He spent another two years in Colditz carrying Douglas Bader up and down stairs for his bath. Getting out of Colditz was extremely difficult and became more so as the war progressed. But getting out of Germany was even harder because you needed all sorts of escape equipment. You needed money. You needed passes. You needed disguises very often. You needed a whole set of kit in order to get out. Now, British intelligence had set up a special section called MI9. Now, we've all heard of MI5 and MI6. MI9 is much less well known. MI9 was the part of British intelligence that was devoted to aiding captured prisoners and encouraging both captured prisoners and downed airmen, particularly, to, to get back to, to Britain or to, or to Allied territory. And so MI9 was in charge of shipping in contraband, really, money and all sorts of things like that. Now, Douglas, uh, um, Reinhold Eggers, the, the German security chief, was no fool. 
And he realized that the Brits, particularly the Brits, were bringing in huge amounts of contraband to help them get out. So he bought in an x-ray machine from a hospital in Dresden and began systematically to x-ray every single parcel, tin of food, letter, everything that arrived. And this is the hall. You can see the delighted German officers. This is the hall from one day of inspecting the intercepted parcels coming in uh, coming into Colditz. So initially, Eggers did very, very well. He was pulling all sorts of stuff out of these parcels. But then it began to dry up. What Eggers didn't know was that, in fact, the French and then the British had worked out a way to break into the parcels office, which meant that the parcels arrived in the evening. At night, the British and French would break in, extract from the parcels what they knew was inside them, what they called the naughty packages, seal them up again. So that by the time Eggers x-rayed them, there was nothing left in them. So how did, the, how did they know when these parcels were arriving? Well, this was because very early on in the war, uh, MI9 developed a thing called the HK code, which was a very complicated numerical and alphabetical code with which the prisoners could write to cover addresses sending secret messages. And more importantly, MI9 could write back in what appeared to be rather banal letters from their families, but were actually warning them when these special packages were going to arrive. Um, the man you see here is, I think, one of the great unsung heroes of the Second World War. Uh, his name was Christopher Clayton Hutton. He was known as Clutty. And he, before the war, he had attempted all sorts of careers, all of which had failed. Um, Clutty was a fascinating character, but he was just about three quarters bonkers. Um, but he was a prodigiously brilliant escapologist and inventor. Um, under the auspices of MI9, he began inventing escape kit and different ways of smuggling escape material into Colditz. He would hide money inside gramophone records in huge, in huge quantities that would then arrive. He worked out ways to put passes into um, Red Cross, not, not the Red Cross parcels actually, but parcels of uh, board games that would arrive for the prisoners to play. But they also knew that these contained perfect passes. He, his, he had a most extraordinary mind, Hutton, Clayton Hutton. I mean, he also worked out a system for importing, for sending in uniforms that had special buttons on them with compasses inside, which unscrewed the wrong way. This was based on the impeccable idea that because the, uh, the Germans were so logical, they would never try to unscrew something the wrong way. Um, he also invented my own favorite thing, uh, he, all sorts of mad gizmos, but one, one of his ideas was that um, before uh, pilots parachuted into occupied France, they should be given garlic-flavored chocolate on the grounds that if they landed and were pretending to be French, their breath had to smell right. And I also love the idea that you couldn't persuade a British person to eat garlic unless he was actually inside chocolate. Um, so Christopher Clayton Hutton was astonishingly successful. Of the 3,000 uh, prisoners and, and downed pilots who managed to get back to Britain, more than half of them were carrying maps made by Christopher Clayton Hutton, which he hid inside boot heels, which he printed on special mulberry leaf paper so that it could be scrunched up into a ball. He, he's an extraordinary figure, Clayton Hutton, and I particularly like his story because we are all very familiar, particularly in this room, with the story of, of, of the war of, of territory, if you like, of guns and bombs and bullets. And then there is the hidden war, the one that I particularly love, the war of espionage and, and deception and, and secrecy. But there's also a war of lateral thinking that goes on. You can fight a war in lots of different ways. Clutty wouldn't have known one end of a gun from the other, but he did fight a special kind of war for which he's never really been appreciated. And he's a proof, I think, if you like, that they also serve who work out how to hide a compass inside a walnut. <laughs> so Reinhold Eggers, the security guard that I told you about, was not only the, the chief of security, he was also the archivist of Colditz. He made it his job to gather together all the artifacts of the different escape attempts that had been made. So every time he interrupted an escape attempt, he would confiscate the, the, the fake uniform, he would confiscate the rope, he would confiscate the different bits and pieces. And he put them all into something which he called the Colditz Museum. Um, 
which was really there to impress visiting German dignitaries. And he became himself rather a celebrated figure, Eggers. He would tour other prison camps and advise uh, the guards there on, on what they were doing wrong and what they should do right. And he amassed an astonishing collection of photographs because amazingly, he managed to persuade prisoners after they had attempted escape to pose reenacting their failed escapes. <laughs> So you have these amazing photographs of these prisoners peering out of the tunnels that have just been rumbled. And, and he persuaded all sorts of people uh, to reenact <laughs> their different sorts of escape. In June 1943, the British contingent was returning from an exercise session in the yard. There was a, um, a part of the park had been laid out with, with a barbed wire enclosure where they were allowed to play sports. And as they were coming back up one day, a, a, a stout-looking German woman walked in the opposite direction, wearing sensible shoes and a, and a, and a hat. Uh, and of course, there were women in Colditz. And in fact, women play an important part in the Colditz story. Uh, there were no women prisoners, but they did play a part. And of course, since she was a woman, they all whistled at her immediately. She paid absolutely no attention, marched stoutly on. But as she was walking past them, she dropped a watch, and one of the British prisoners picked it up and shouted after her, uh, Fraulein, you, you've, you've dropped your watch. She, wa she marched on. So he handed it to one of the German guards who ran after uh, this woman and took one du massive double take when he got closer and noticed her five o'clock shadow and discovered that this was in fact a French officer dolled up in a wig and skirt. But what's even more extraordinary is that Eggers then managed to persuade this man to do it again <laughs> so that he could take an enduring photograph of him. Um, one of the last stories I'm going to tell you from Colditz is a love story. Uh, this is a photograph of a debonair flying officer called Chenek Chalupka, who was inevitably nicknamed Checo um, by the British officers. He had flown for the Czech Air Force, he then flew for the French, uh, he then flew for the British. And he was shot down in the channel and, and taken to Colditz. Um, on his way, in the in the train compartment. He found himself sharing it. He was manacled and he was under guard, but he found he was sharing it with a rather an attractive young woman. Uh, she was called Irm, Irma, Irmagard Wernicke, and she was the daughter of the head of the Nazi party in Colditz town, but she was also assistant to the town dentist. And in the course of this very long train journey, a Tendresse, if you like, developed between Checo and Irma. And at the end, she whispered to him, as, as they were climbing out of the carriage, she whispered to him, fake a dental emergency and come and see me and we'll meet again. So sure enough, Checo was a kind of very dodgy character. He would end up running the black market inside Colditz. He was one of those people who seemed to be able to get anything for a, for a bunch of cigarettes and onions and passes and money and so on. Um, but he was also extremely imaginative, and he managed to get himself a, 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 an appointment with the dentist by dint of chipping one of his teeth with a rock. Um, so he managed to get himself down to the dentist where he bribed the dentist with cigarettes to allow him some time with Irma in the back room. Um, he was said to be the only prisoner in Colditz who had ever kissed a girl. He claimed he'd done a lot more than kiss old Irma. Um, he did this apparently 10 different times he managed to get himself down to the dentist. By the end of the war, his teeth were in an appalling state. <laughs> but his love life was going gangbusters. <laughs> but actually, there was a lot more to Irmagard Wernicke than just an, a, a sort of infatuated dental assistant. Um, Colditz was a very Nazi little town. And her father, as I said, was the head of the Nazi party there. But Irma was one of a small group, but a growing group, of young Germans who were strongly opposed to the, the Hitler project and were actively working against it. And she began to supply Checo with very important intelligence. Troop, local troop displacements, where the armory was kept, who were the local senior Nazis, including her father. And this information was being sent back to Britain in coded letters. There was an entire spy network operating inside Colditz Castle. So I said to you um, that the Americans played a very important part at the end of the Colditz story. 
as the first army was approaching Kolditz from the west, and as the Soviets were pincering, really, coming from the east, the SS retreated to Kolditz town and threatened the commandant that they were going to take over the castle. And it was our old friend, Florimund Duke III, who negotiated, really, an agreement with the German commandant to make it look as if the German guards were still in control when they weren't. He persuaded the commandant to allow them access to the armory should they need it. And so in the final days of Kolditz, as the first army was approaching, you had an extraordinary situation where the prisoners had become the guards, and the guards had secretly become their prisoners. So the liberators of Kolditz were four GIs from the 9th Armored Division, a reconnaissance unit that was sent ahead. And the first civilian into the castle was this person, again, someone that very few people have ever heard of. Her name was Lee Carson. And she was an astonishing woman war reporter. Uh, we all know about Martha Gellhorn, but Lee Carson's achievement was in some ways even more extraordinary. Um, she had worked for good housekeeping before the war. Um, she, had, she came from Chicago. And she was then sent out as a, a news service reporter. Now, women reporters were technically not allowed near the front. Uh, Lee Carson paid absolutely no attention to anything like that. She managed to smuggle herself onto a bomber and was the only woman reporter to witness uh, the D-Day uh, assault on Cherbourg. She, then the, the British and, and others were always trying to keep the women away from the front. And in fact, uh, at the liberation from Paris, all the women reporters were locked into a hotel in Rennes. Um, but Lee Carson broke out through a window and managed to hitch a ride with the Reuters correspondent going into Paris and insisted on sitting in the front seat. So she was, in fact, the first reporter into, 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 into liberated Paris. She then attached herself to the First Army and was the first civilian into Kolditz. Um, she was also, as you can tell from this photograph, astonishingly beautiful. Um, her impact on a group of prisoners, uh, some of whom had been inside the castle for four years, was electric. Um, she very nearly caused a riot um, as she arrived in her sort of homemade boiler suit. And within a few hours of her arrival, um, the prisoners were on their way back to Britain. Um, I've always loved the Colditz story. I, I grew up playing the Colditz board game, believe it or not. One of the things that Pat Reed was to invent uh, a game called Escape from Colditz which is, is, that is literally what it is. You, you plot yourself on the castle, and you can be Dutch or French or British, or you can be the commandant. Uh, it's actually quite a good idea to be the commandant, I discovered. I bought it um, during lockdown and forced my children to play it. Um, <laughs> it's tremendously good fun. It's a very, very simple game. It's all about getting out. And that was exactly how Pat Reed saw the Colditz experience. It was a game. But of course, it really wasn't a game, Colditz. Colditz was a place, as I say, deeply divided. It was a place where mental health was under huge stress. None of that comes into the board game. And, and in writing this book, I wanted to write a book that didn't destroy the myth at all, I hope. And the escapes are all still there. But it is also a story about other sorts of human being, because we're not all created out of this sort of straight-grained timber that Pat Reed represented and, and that became part of the Colditz story. Lots of other different sorts of people ended up in Colditz, and they all responded in slightly different ways to the circumstances they were in. Some took pleasure in reading, some put on theater, and some tried to escape. I think I would probably have been one of those who just buried themselves in a book or tried to write about it. But I suppose one of the questions I tried to ask with this one <laughs> is, is in this extraordinary artificial world, where you are locked up for four years, what would you have done in Colditz? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, folks, I think you can see why we've been so eager to have Ben here. Ben, thank you so much. As uh, detailed as the talk was, having read your book, I know there are a lot you left out. Uh, we're now ready for question and answer, so please raise your hand. 
We'll bring the microphone to you. We're going to start to your left, Ben, with Connie. If you could please stand, ma'am. Hi, Ben. Hello. Um, thank you, for, at first, for being unambiguous about questions of sexuality. Because very early on, I was like, is this a thing? So thank you for that. Um, I have two questions. One is a little bit silly, and one's kind of a footnote, but mm -hmm. I'm curious. First of all, the Polish prisoners, you say they were all accorded privileges according to the Geneva Convention, but I know that German propaganda and German race theory didn't really see Poles as fully human, so I want to know how or why they were given those rights in this context. This is, next one is the silly question. <laughs> you mentioned the theatrical productions, so I know that when Shakespeare was writing, women weren't allowed to be on stage, so all the actors had to be dudes. Did <laughs> they put on Shakespearean productions in this prison camp? Uh, let me answer the second one, which is not silly at all. Yes, they did a lot of Shakespeare. They did a lot of Shakespeare. And in a way, you could argue it was closer to the kind of Shakespeare that Shakespeare himself would have put on, because absolutely all the female characters were played by men who immediately became objects of desire. Uh, to some. So it's a, it's a fascinating kind of part of the story that's never been told. You're absolutely right about the Poles. The Poles were not regarded by the Germans as being signatories to the Geneva Convention because as far as the Germans were concerned, the Polish state had vanished, that there was no longer a Polish state. And so the Poles were treated as officers but on sufferance. Um, and it was made absolutely clear to them that the Germans did not regard them as being on the same level as the other officers. And the Poles, to their great credit, made it absolutely clear that they did not regard the Germans as being anything other than complete scum. Um, and in fact, the, the Poles had a very elaborate system. If, if ever a German touched them, they would recoil uh, as if they'd sort of caught leprosy. I mean, they, they couldn't have been more difficult. And in fact, they were very effective escapers, the Poles. They were, they were indefatigable. Um, that, uh, and, and achieved some extraordinary, some extraordinary effects. Um, yes, lovely. We have a question towards the center, Ben. I'll get to it in just a moment. You showed the photograph of the impregnable castle on the cliff, and thank you. I was struck. Um, is there any chance that Castle Colditz was the inspiration for Alastair McLean's novel and subsequent movie, Where Eagles Dare? Hmm. I'd be very surprised. I, I don't know if it was, but I would be equally surprised if it wasn't because Colditz became so famous after the war. It became absolutely embedded into sort of British life. And I'd be very surprised if Maclean hadn't, hadn't seen it as, as, as the model for that. Um, I don't know if it was directly done. It's a very strange place, Colditz, because it's actually, believe it or not, it is now partly a hotel. Um, you can stay in the sort of German quarters. I spent quite a lot of my summer there when I was researching it. Everyone has to have a holiday somewhere, and I decided to spend mine in Colditz. Um, it's actually quite comfortable, but it's, it's a very strange place. It, it's not nearly as looming and sinister now as it was then. It's been painted white and it's been done up. And it's actually rather beautiful, it, it, but it towers over the landscape. It's a really, very much like um, the, 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 the scene in Where Eagles Dare. It, it is a sort of hilltop schloss. It's, it's, it looks more like a fairy sort of castle now than it does like a sort of terrifying Dracula's castle, as it were. But it's a, it's a peculiar place, and it's, uh, I was there for quite a long time, and I found, I found it very eerie. I found that it was a place full of unquiet ghosts, and I was sort of allowed to wander the courtyards on my own. I, I spooked myself very considerably. Um, but it's a, it's a most remarkable place. They don't quite know what to do with it. It has a very small um, museum in it, which I think could really do with enlarging. But um, it's, it is, it's a very strange place. Um, yes, any more? Ben, we have a question in the back to your right, please. So I've had the pleasure of reading Agent Zigzag and Double Cross uh, and Spy and Traitor, which I think is fabulous. Thank you. But I'd be interested of your other espionage books about World War II, which would be your favorite, if that's like asking a father 
which child? Well, it's, um, it is a little, actually, because I love them all equally. But um, you mentioned Agent Zigzag, and that, that is the one that sort of set me off on this espionage trail. A Agent Zigzag is the story of a, a, a second, uh, he was a pre-Second World War crook. His name was Eddie Chapman, and he was a con man and a burglar and a safe cracker. Um, and he happened to be, he was very charming and very handsome, and he happened to be in Jersey, uh, in the Channel Islands, in prison, when the Nazis invaded, and he did a deal with them. Um, he said that if you train me up as a spy and parachute me into Britain, I'll never betray the German cause because I'm facing an enormous rap sheet in Britain and I'll go to prison forever, so you can rely on me. So they did, they trained him up in a, in a spy school in Nantes in, in southern France and parachuted him into Cambridgeshire in 1941 uh, where he landed, fell over, broke his nose and immediately defected to MI5 <laughs> and became a, a highly successful double agent for British intelligence. Um, the problem with Eddie Chapman was that he was such a crook uh, that no one could really ever quite tell whose side he was on. So he was codenamed Agent Zigzag uh, on the grounds that if he zigged, he might also zag. Um, but he was hugely successful, and he was the only um, double agent who was then sent back into occupied, um, into occupied Europe. And he, 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 was, he was a most remarkable man, an absolutely sort of incorrigible criminal. Um, but also incredibly attractive and good fun. Um, I always wished I'd met him, actually, because he was, he was completely unstoppable. He died in 1996. He actually ended up, believe it or not, as the crime correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, um, <laughs> where he would write long and elaborate columns warning the readers against people like himself. Um, but I always loved him, and I think he sort of set me off on this sort of strange trail, really. I, I would love to have met him, because I think you'd have had a terrific night out in Soho. You'd have paid for all the drinks. Um, uh, he'd have told you lots of stories. Some of them would have been true. You'd have staggered off into the night. And then at some point, you'd have thought, hang on. <laughs> He's stolen my wallet. Because he was completely unstoppable. Um, but I feel I sort of owe him a debt, really, and, and that was the one that sort of set me off on the espionage trail because MI5 released his, um, his intelligence files, and the zigzag files are extraordinary because they, they stand about that high. There are thousands of pages of documents in them, and they are, they are just a wonderful trove for a writer of narrative nonfiction because these are secret, really. I mean, they are intended to be kept secret. They're written by people who never expected them to be made public. And so they're, they're kind of honest in a way that government files usually aren't. You know, government files are usually there to present a particular point of view of the person who is writing them. The, the zigzag files are honest, and, and when it goes wrong, and believe me, with Eddie Chapman, it frequently went wrong, um, they are honest about it. And it, it gives you a sort of the warp and the weft of the reality that is completely wonderful, I think. So I think of, of the children, I'd probably give it to Eddie Chapman, the dreadful Eddie Chapman. Um, Yes. Ben, uh, we have a question to your right, please. Oh, I can't see them. Where are they? Thank you for the presentation first, Ben. Pleasure. Um, the serious question will follow, but the first one, seriously, vacation at Schultz? <laughs> You'll have a life or a wife to prevent you to do things like that? Oh, no, she came too. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, wow. no, she loved it. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> You'll teach me that later, Actually, okay? She did. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm curious about the fact that uh, were there the same thing, like this social class division in other nationalities, like the French or the Polish or whoever they were? Um, yes. Who were the French, by the way, who were there? There were, the, there were the same divisions, absolutely. It was part of the Geneva Convention that, that, you, that all officers had the right to their own servants. I don't think it applied to the Poles, by the way. Uh, I think that was one of the ways that, that, that they were restricted. But the other nations undoubtedly had orderlies to look after them. And the French contingent was, was further divided by race. The, the, uh, one of the most sort of shocking things I discovered about Colditz was that very soon after the French contingent arrived, the Aryan French soldiers, if you like, announced that they would no longer, they refused to be billeted with the Jewish French soldiers. 
So the, Jew, the, the Germans, spotting again a, a prime propaganda opportunity, moved the French Jews to the attic, uh, which immediately became referred to as the ghetto. And it caused a huge division within Colditz, particularly actually between the French and British contingents. Airy Neve, for example, was absolutely outraged at the idea that, that some of these French officers, they were all officers, but the sort of more pro-Vichy element in the French contingent, who were, you know, Pétainists, who were, who were still supporters of the, of the Pétain collaborationist government, were also anti-Semitic racists and demanded that the Jews be kept separately. That, that seemed to me to be an astonishing idea, but it gives you an idea of just how completely the world inside Colditz really did mirror the world outside it. I mean, they, they brought with them not only a lot of the good qualities that they had, but a lot of the prejudices and, and the bigotry that was prevalent outside. Another question to your left with Connie. Can you tell us if there were acts of brutality within the prison itself by the guards, especially retribution against those prisoners who attempted to escape? The short answer is none. There was no, I mean, there were incidents. That if you were trying to escape and you refused to stop, you were quite likely to be shot. And that, that happened periodically, and that was understood to be part of the game. But no, there was no systematic brutality against, against the prisoners. And if they escaped, the worst that happened to them was that they were, they were, when they were recaptured, if they were recaptured, they were brought back to Colditz, and then they would spend three weeks or four weeks in solitary confinement, and then they were out again. But it has to be said that the whole atmosphere in Colditz changed dramatically and permanently after Hitler issued the, the notorious commando order, which you'll, many of you will be familiar with, which was when Hitler had become so enraged by the um, uh, commando activities in, in occupied Europe that he ordered that anybody caught behind the lines, as it were, in civilian clothes, who was, who was actually an allied soldier, was to be treated as a spy and shot. And at that point, the whole actuarial calculation involved in escaping from Colditz changed completely because no longer was it a game. In fact, the commandant put up a notice saying, escaping is no longer a game. If you are caught outside the walls, you will be killed. And inevitably, the number of escapes diminished dramatically. I mean, there were very, very few escapes after that. They didn't stop completely. Um, but one of the most tragic ones, in fact, was, was the escape of a man called Michael Sinclair, who was an absolutely obsessive escaper, but who climbed the wire quite near the end of the war, it was probably an act of suicide because he, he knew that the German guards w were going to stop him, and sure enough, he was killed. But in fact, he was the only person who was killed by the German guards while trying to escape. Um, many were injured. Some were injured, not many. But, but no, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't, look, it wasn't a holiday camp. It was not a place you'd want to spend your holidays. But it, was, but, it, but it wasn't a place of systematic savagery. And it, we have to bear in mind that the Wehrmacht uh, were not all Nazis. I mean, Eggers himself w was not a Nazi. He never joined the Nazi party. In fact, he disdained the Nazi party, um, which didn't mean that he escaped from that, um, uh, that association. I mean, Eggers' story is, is tragic in lots of ways because he, he went back to being a schoolmaster after the war, uh, but, he, but Kolditz was in the Soviet zone, and the NKVD, the predecessor of the KGB, came hunting for him because it was assumed that having been the security officer in Kolditz, he must therefore have been a Nazi, and he was, he was sent to a Soviet camp for 10 years. He did 10 years in one of those appalling places, and he suffered far more than any of the, of the Allied soldiers who had been under his control in Colditz. But he, he was an extraordinary man. He, 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 he had no rancor. It was very, it was very strange. He, he, he didn't hold it against the ex-prisoners. And in fact, there's, there's a, a British television program called This Is Your Life. Um, I don't know if there was an American equivalent, but it was where sort of famous people were brought in. And there was a This Is Your Life episode for Pat Reed, and the surprise guest was Reinhold Eggers, was brought in. And the, I mean, he was, and Reed was absolutely astonished to see him again. So, I mean, it was, it was, it was a sort of strange example of sort of foes coming together again as, as sort of friends in, in later life. Eggers is a very remarkable man, I think. Um, but no, there was, it wasn't a systematically brutal place. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the book is Prisoners of the Castle, and the speaker is Ben McIntyre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Ben, thank you for that. You know, we've got some new terms, goon baiting, uh, prominente, a little bonkers. But I have to admit, you know, what you described, you know, four years locked up, really bizarre creativity, kind of a remote place, looks like a medieval castle. Sounds a lot like West Point to me. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know, you know. I'm not sure how, how bizarre this really is, but... Uh, I think I can relate to it. I had to realize it was it was uh, Coldest Castle, not not West Point, New York. But uh, you know, thanks for that. That uh, it, it it brings back a lot of memories. Not all of them good, but uh, pretty amazing. You know, thanks everybody here. You know, uh, thanks to Ben for the amazing presentation. You know, the amazing. Let's give him a huge round of applause. You know, thanks all of you for joining us for the 15th annual international conference. Um, we we uh, we had hoped tonight to uh, wish uh, Jim Deal his happy 100th birthday. So uh, let's just give a quick shout out and just say happy birthday, Jim. So on three, one, two, three, happy birthday, Jim. I think it's pretty cool. So, you know, our goal is to have Jim here next year. The, uh, and, uh, you know, as Stephen mentioned, this truly is our, our foremost adult education event of the year. We're thrilled that you can join in this, but also enrich it by your presence and by your participation. And, you know, this has uh, been an incredible event, and I think uh, everyone's taken something from every session. And, uh, you know, if you didn't, you were probably in the hallway, because I don't know how else you know, that, that, uh, it's been a pretty amazing event. You know, certainly uh, we hope you return to New Orleans uh, frequently, but uh, for next year's conference, uh, it'll be the 7th through the 9th of December. Uh, if, if you uh, get a chance, register for the early bird discount uh, with one of our travel team members. You know, thanks to the travel team for really facilitating that, and Sarah team, you guys have been ph phenomenal. And uh, for everybody here, you know, God bless you, Godspeed, have a great night, safe travels home, and uh, I really look forward to seeing you not only throughout the year, but again next year uh, for the next iteration. So with that, thank you very much.